hey, 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 hey. What's up, everybody? Uh, I am here, and we have the attorney, Andrew Bronco, in the house. What's up, Andrew? Living large, man. Happy to be back again. I know. I'm living pretty large, too, after the holidays, man. Oh, man. It's a good thing I set my scales back 10 pounds with my clocks in the fall because holidays kick in pretty hard. We're not here to talk about the holidays, though, are we? No. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this is Calling the Shots. This man right here is Andrew Bronca. He literally wrote the book, The Law of Self-Defense. We're going to be talking about the law of self-defense. So when you are carrying your firearm to protect yourself and your family, where are you protected? By the law. Uh, so those are the things we're going to be talking about. We're going to have some video footage for you guys to call the shots on. Let's see how good you've... Uh, how far you've come on knowing the law. Uh, again, there's all kinds of things available to you at Calling the Shots. The Law of Self Defense.com is the website. We're going to give you more information on that. But that's what it is. It's Calling the Shots. We got a whole bunch of cool stuff for you in store today. You know what time it is. It's time to fire away. All right, so just to clarify a couple of things, we are not talking about gun laws here. We uh, don't want to get into the specific laws, gun states like that. What we're talking about is self-defense law, which does vary a little bit from state to state, which is why you can get your own state-specific DVD from the law of self-defense. Uh, we've also got some books. We've got all kinds of things. You can win cool stuff in the raffle. Yesterday, you won the top 10 things you probably didn't know. And brain range. Uh, we got a lot of cool things to talk about. Uh, Andrew, welcome and thank you for being here. My pleasure, Nate, as always. Uh, yeah. Did you have a good New Year's? Good holidays? It was fantastic. And I hope everyone out there had a safe and happy Christmas, New Year's, whatever holidays they may celebrate. Mine was awesome. Yes, mine as well. Um, I know that we talk about the five elements of self-defense here often. For those of you who don't know, uh, well, actually, I'm not the professional here. Andrew, why don't you explain a little bit about the five elements of the law of self-defense? Sure. Most people's exposure to self-defense law is pretty complicated. They get read some statutes in the concealed carry class or someplace. They hear a lot of legalese, and it becomes very difficult to understand uh, either the law or how it would apply in the real world. The good news is self-defense law is actually pretty simple, folks, and I say that as an expert in the field. Uh, any claim of self-defense only has up to five elements, five components. That's it. That's the maximum it can have. Often it doesn't have that many. And if you don't know what those are, you're simply not in a position to understand in any way how self-defense law is applied to real-world use of force events, why we get these legal outcomes that we get in these court decisions, how prosecutors make decisions, why people get convicted and acquitted. You must know these five elements. And not only are there only five, but they apply in all 50 states, all U.S. territories. Every state has its own statutes, jury instructions, case law, but they're all based on the same five elements. And I've got some good news for everyone. We actually have a free infographic that we make available that has the five elements of self-defense. There you see the pretty version of it right there. Uh, you can go to lawselfdefense.com slash begin, as it says there, or lawselfdefense.com slash elements, and you'll be able to download that PDF for free. And if you like what you see there, we have an even better offer. Uh, for a brief period of time, to start off 2020, we're making our best-selling book, The Law of Self-Defense 3rd Edition, available for free. This is normally 25 bucks or so on Amazon, plus shipping and handling. Uh, we do ask that you cover the shipping and handling, which is about eight ninety five. But if you do that, you can get the book for free, and that's at lawselfdefense.com slash book. Okay, so wait. Let me just get this straight. There's 332 people here on Facebook. There's 41 people on YouTube. You're telling me that every single one of them can get a free book right now? Absolutely. Everybody. Every y'all listening up? Do you all listen into that right now? Yes, get your free book. Just pay the shipping and handling. LawofSelfDefense.com forward slash book. And right folks, now. crazy if you don't do it, honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a case right now with a poor client who was involved in a use of force event, uh, killed 
The other person is now charged with murder. If they're convicted, they'll go to jail for the rest of their life. And I, there's no doubt, whatever in my mind, if they'd simply taken two or three hours in an afternoon and read this book, they wouldn't be making use of my legal services right now and be looking at spending the rest of their life in prison. Man, right. This is serious stuff that we're talking about here. I love this show. Can I just say that? I love this show. Uh, because it is very valuable. And I think that uh, a lot of people are misinformed or think that they know what the law is, uh, assume that they know, maybe have been told by a somebody the wrong information, but they think that's the actual law. But knowing the actual law is so important. I mean, there's a specific example right there. So uh, we probably should just uh, get this thing going here. That's the five elements of uh, self-defense that you need to know download yours right now so when we have these shows every Wednesday at this time you can re refer to it and uh, know exactly what we're talking about I am sorry for the lag I'm being told that there is a little bit of a delay on the audio uh, we are gonna try to work that out uh, if we can add a delay or something like that I don't know what Riley's the mastermind behind there so we're gonna try to figure out what that delay is about uh, Andrew is your sound good on your end uh, my sound is good, but of course I have the live feed from uh, Wirecast. Uh, it, it does look like, uh, well, it's hard to tell. Is is this only on YouTube? I'm watching it on YouTube. It's on Facebook and YouTube, so I don't okay. know if it's uh, if it's lagged on YouTube, but it is apparently on Facebook. I'm being told it's a little better on YouTube. YouTube. I'm being told that if you go on over to YouTube, uh, you're going to be able to get a better audio video lineup. Speaking of lineup, we uh, we have an awesome lineup today. We've got some videos, and I really hope you all have paid attention because I want you to call the shots here. I want you to check these videos out and then make the decision in your mind of what do you think? What is it? A good shot, bad shot, win, when you shouldn't. And, uh, Andrew, I'm going to give you the floor now so you talk a little bit about this video. Which one are we going to show first? Which one do you want to show first? Andrew? Anyone? Uh uh, whichever one you guys pick, just tell me which one it is. I guess I'll know as soon as it starts. But Riley, we have the road rage one, and then we road have rage. the guy who shoots at the process server. Let's do the road rage first and foremost. Okay. Go. As usual, we're going to loop it. Is that yes, right? Sir. Okay. All right, folks. So we're start looping the video. Here we have. Uh, this is the defender. He's driving in his car. He gets cut off by this pickup truck in the right lane. Swerves in front of him. And bang, there's a fender bender right there. Uh, they proceed a little further, and then the pickup brake checks him again. There's a second bang. Uh, now, obviously, everyone's quite upset, uh, particularly the driver of the car. He tells this woman passenger to call 911, so she gets on the phone with police pretty quick. They pull into this parking lot here. The pickup truck does, followed by the car. And at this point, the car pulls up next to the pickup, and the pickup truck driver, who appears to be by himself, and by his uh, verbiage, which we've muted as usual because there's a lot of cursing going on, uh, is uh, appears to be, in some fashion, emotionally disturbed. So the two men now begin the typical male monkey dance, by which I mean we've all seen probably 2001 A Space Odyssey, the movie, the scene where the monkeys fight in it. Uh, now these guys are puffing out their chest, making big noises at each other. I've cut out little pieces of the video here so we can stick to the action. There's a pickup truck driver. He's looking at the back of his truck where there's damage. He's yelling at the car driver. The car driver is yelling back at him. Um, the car driver uh, decides to get out of his own vehicle, which is an extremely bad idea on many levels. Now he's outside the protection of his vehicle. He also loses a lot of legal protections that he would otherwise have. There's the driver of the car. He's looking at the front of his vehicle, checking out the damage. Uh, the pickup driver now is, is really screaming like an emotionally disturbed person, which should set off all kinds of alarm bells. You're not dealing with a rational person anymore. The uh, Pretty soon now, the pickup driver is going to uh, begin to... the Both he and the car driver will be in the scene right about now. <clears throat> now, you'll see the pickup driver is much larger than this gentleman, much larger than the car driver, enormously larger. Um, the car driver at this point has pulled out his gun. So he's got a gun in his right hand. Note a moment ago, he had his phone in his right hand. He was talking on it, presumably to the police, and he had to switch hands. Something to keep in mind, folks. Uh, you need to learn how to use your phone with your left hand if you intend to use your gun with your right hand. Now the pickup driver is shouting, go ahead, kill me, kill me, which is not a legal justification for killing anyone, obviously. 
Uh, fortunately, the uh, here the car driver is, is making good decisions. He's staying back. He's maintaining space. He's uh, demanding that the pickup driver stay back, which is very useful information. Using your voice to either compel the person who's scaring you to stop doing what's scaring you or to act consistent with a threat. If the pickup driver had kept closing the distance, that would have been an articulable threat. Now, I mentioned earlier that getting out of the car is a very bad idea. It's a very bad idea on a number of levels. Uh, one, of course, is you're putting yourself at greater physical risk. It's easier for the other person to access you. Um, but there's another factor here that many people aren't aware of, and that it's in many states, uh, your vehicle is treated much like your home, much like your castle. And uh, those states often create special provisions of law uh, when you're defending yourself against an intruder into your castle. It creates a legal presumption that you had a reasonable fear of an eminent deadly force attack. Uh, we've talked about the five elements and the importance of getting our infographic on the five elements, but what that legal presumption does for you when you're dealing with an intruder in that protected space is give you most of those five elements you need to justify your use of deadly defensive force. If you're in your car and they come into your car, you have a legal presumption you are acting in lawful self-defense. The moment you step out of your car, you lose that legal presumption. Also, it's always better for you if the fight comes to you rather than you going to the fight. And when you get out of your car, it begins to look like you're going to the fight. You could be portrayed as a mutual combatant, meaning you've been offered an invitation to fight and you've accepted that invitation. And usually if two people are mutual combatants, both of them lose the legal justification of self-defense because the law considers both of them to be unlawful aggressors in the confrontation. So that's not a perception you want to create, whether it's true or not, folks. Remember, the people judging your conduct in these use of force events, they don't know what actually happened. I mean, here we're fortunate enough to have a dash cam, which is helpful, although not definitive. There's many times in this video when both men are off camera, for example. Andrew, so the right, right here, just a quick question. So that guy is way bigger, obviously. I know in the past yep. we've talked about um, that being something... Uh, I don't know how that correlates with the elements, the law of self-defense right there, but can at what point, let's call the shot right here. At any point, is he able to, I mean, he's not actually being physically assaulted. He hasn't, the other bigger man hasn't shown a gun. Um, basically, this guy did what he was supposed to do, other than maybe he shouldn't have drawn his firearm right there. But at any point, yeah, so, I mean, could he have legally that's... used that deadly force? Uh, probably he didn't need to in this circumstance because he convinced the other person to maintain their distance, convinced the truck driver to maintain his distance. He's probably in good shape having pulled his gun, given the disparity of size. That goes to the degree of threat he's facing from the truck driver. Uh, having said that, remember, anytime we're talking about self-defense, we're first talking about vulnerability to a criminal charge. The only time you raise self-defense is as a legal defense to a criminal charge. And the moment you display a gun, make the other person aware that you have a gun for the purpose of changing their behavior, which is, of course, what you're doing in self-defense. That's exactly what this car driver is doing. He's displaying his handgun for the purpose of changing the pickup driver's behavior. The moment you do that, you've technically committed an aggravated assault with a firearm. Now, you can justify that conduct if it was necessary self-defense. And I think he's got a very strong narrative here that it was, in fact, necessary self-defense. So I think he's in pretty good shape on that. But you can be compelled to make that legal argument in defense against a criminal charge. And if you are compelled to do that, you're looking at thirty to $50,000 for a legal retainer just to make that argument without, I'm not even talking about the prospects of actually going to trial. So let me, uh, let me ask this question. I'm sure this is in some people's minds too. So little guy and big guy, okay? We know who's who. Little guy pulls his gun is now that entitled the big guy to pull a gun uh, to pull a gun and use deadly force because the little guy has a gun he's obviously shown it he knows he has it you don't know what he's going to do with it right so it could be argued either way if you believe that the big guy represented a imminent deadly force threat to which the smaller guy was justified in pulling his gun 
Well, then uh, by making that coming to that conclusion, you've concluded that the larger guy was the initial deadly force aggressor. If he's the initial deadly force aggressor, he can't claim self-defense to defend himself against a smaller guy. He's the guy that created the deadly force confrontation. On the other hand, you could also argue that, well, the bigger guy didn't have a weapon. Uh, you may believe he was not, in fact, a deadly force threat, however scary he might have been, in which case the smaller guy is the initial deadly force aggressor. And if the smaller guy is the initial deadly force aggressor, then the larger guy would be entitled to defend himself against the threat of that gun. Uh, so it all depends on, you know, based on the totality of the circumstances, who you believe was the initial deadly force aggressor. Now, I think the smaller guy is in pretty good shape because of the size disparity. And arguably because there's also the woman passenger in the car that we don't see in this video, but you could hear on the audio talking to 911. If these men were of similar size, strength, fighting ability, otherwise identical, I think the car driver going to the gun would be much more difficult to justify. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult, uh, I guess, decision to make in those moments. Somebody pulls a firearm on you um, and trying to think, now, is this justified? Is it not justified? And, and there's a lot to go into that. But I, I, I guess I was under the assumption that I'm the, let's just say I'm the big guy, right? I'm not here to get in a fight. I'm just mad. I'm just telling him verbally, hey, man, you're an idiot, whatever. But uh, he pulls a gun on me. To, to me, what I would think is that you just escalated it to a deadly force situation, little guy. And I'm pulling my firearm because I don't know what you're going to do with that thing. And I'm going to be in this situation immediately. Right. So wrong? The, smaller, the smaller guy having pulled his gun would need to be able to articulate, this is why I believed I was facing a deadly force threat, meaning a force capable of causing me death or serious bodily injury that justified me pulling my gun. There was a much larger man verbalizing very aggressively in a threatening way, rapidly closing distance on me. That's a reasonable uh, fact pattern on which to infer that you're about to be subject to what could be a deadly force attack. That would justify you displaying the gun. Uh, again, if the men were a similar size, strength, fighting ability, if, the, if some of those subtle facts were even slightly different, the justification for this displaying the gun goes away. And if it's not justified, it's unlawful. And if it's unlawful, then the other person can certainly defend themselves against that unlawful threat of force. So basically pick on someone your own size. Pretty much. Uh, or, or, or just don't. I mean, well, this is really a problem in you know conflict avoidance. Uh, frankly, at every step of the process, the, right. the honking of, of the horn that got the pickup driver unreasonably but angry in the first place, right? Uh, is there any point to honking a horn at someone? I mean, other than as a genuine warning, hey, you're about yeah, to back right. up with me or something like that. Honking out of anger uh, could be perfectly lawful, but it rarely results in a better situation than what you had before. Um, in this case, now we have a couple of brake checks, a couple car collisions, by the way, which is going to be very difficult for that car driver to justify. I mean, in most states, if you run into the back of someone's car, it doesn't really matter what they mm -hmm. did. It's your responsibility to main di maintain yeah. distance and not hit the rear of someone else's vehicle. And frankly, watching this video, it seems to me that car driver could have avoided yeah. those collisions. It almost felt like, how dare you get in front of me? I'm going to scare you into pulling ahead. And then the pickup truck didn't pull ahead, and they ended up having the collision. Uh, in terms of them pulling into the parking lot, look, you want to get the guy's plate number. Uh, maybe you want to keep the guy in sight until the police actually show up. But you can do that from the far end of the parking lot. Don't pull up next to the guy. What if that guy has his own gun? Uh, now he's in yeah. an easy position to shoot you from his vehicle, right? So yeah. m stay no closer than you need to stay for purposes of observation. Don't place yourself at, at further physical risk. Absolutely. Um, thank you all for being here. This is Colin the Shots. This is Andrew Bronca. He wrote the book, The Law of Self-Defense. It could be yours right now for free. Just pay shipping and handling. Lawofselfdefense.com forward slash book. All right, we've got another video here uh, we want to get to. I know uh, I want to hear what you have to say about this. So uh, let's let's just take it away here. So this one is a process server at a uh, at the shooter's home. He's just serving process. The, the shooter is someone who's in a lot of legal trouble all the time. So he's constantly being served for court papers as he is here. He doesn't want to open up the door. He's telling the process server, get off my property or you're going to be dead. The process server is saying, hey, man, I just got some papers for you. Why don't you open the door? 
Of course, the process server just wants him to open a door so he can serve him with the court papers. That's his job. Eventually, he says, all right, listen, I'll get off your property. I'm walking away. Uh, and he walks out into kind of the middle of the yard there. And he says, uh, listen, stop threatening me with, for being on your property. Uh, I'm just trying to serve some court papers as the law entitles me to do. And uh, I'll just wait for you outside, okay? And at this point, he says, I'll wait for you outside. And kablam, a shot's fired. The process server is injured. The shooter ends up charged with aggravated uh, battery with a firearm, which is uh, in this circumstance will be a 10 year or better uh, felony for sure. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, what's justified here? Can you shoot someone for simply trespassing on your property? And of course, the answer is no, especially in a place on your property that's designed for people to approach your property, like a sidewalk and a front stoop. That's where people are supposed to go uh, to knock on your door, to get your attention. Um, it's different than if you're sneaking around in the fence backyard of your company of your property, for example, but even then you wouldn't be able to shoot him, use deadly force simply for a simple trespass on property, meaning simply being uh, physically present. You can use non-deadly force to remove somebody from your property, although of course then there's always the risk that your initiation of non-deadly force will escalate the situation to one that requires deadly force, which would not be good. Uh, better if you live uh, in a not very um, rural area if you live in a urban or suburban area of course to call the police to deal with trespassers uh the police have all kinds of wonderful stuff they have uh, partners they have dogs they have shotguns helicopters they have qualified kevlar. immunity <laughs> suit, they got kevlar they got big guns small guns um, and of course it's what they get paid to do anyway so all the better if you can call them to do it uh, in this particular of course case of course that's not an option for this shooter because uh, he's not dealing with a criminal trespasser. He's dealing with someone serving him with court papers. He just doesn't want to be served with the court papers. Now, the reason this case came to my attention was because the shooter tried to argue in court that he was entitled to self-defense immunity, um, often mistakenly referred to as a stand-your-ground hearing. What self-defense immunity does for you, what it allows for, is traditionally... Uh, if you were being criminally charged and brought to trial and you wanted to argue self-defense as your legal defense, you had to make that argument at trial. And at trial means hundreds of thousands of dollars, months or years of time, and the prospect of potentially being found guilty and going to prison. What self-defense immunity laws do for you is allow that decision of whether or not it was self-defense to be made pre-trial, at a pre-trial hearing, that instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars cost a few thousands of dollars, that instead of taking months or years, takes a few weeks. It's a way of accelerating that decision on self-defense way earlier than would traditionally be permitted. But it's not an alternative way of claiming self-defense. You have to meet the same self-defense requirements, whether you're making the argument at trial or pre-trial. You have to, for example, have actually been facing a threat, which this particular shooter clearly was not doing. Uh, so his self-defense at trial, which he will now proceed to, uh, is unlikely to be successful. And just this past week, his self-defense claim at that pre-trial hearing was rejected. Uh, so he'll have to make it again at trial if he decides to do that. And you said that can carry a 10-year sentence. At least, sure, yeah. and, and in some jurisdictions. A lot of it is uh, typical for an aggravated battery would be something along the lines of 10 years, 5 to 10 years. But in many states, there's also a firearm sentencing enhancement. So the fact that you committed the battery, and of course the battery simply means you used force against another person unlawfully. Aggravated battery means uh, you used deadly force against another person, force likely to cause death or serious bodily injury, which certainly shooting them does. Um, and, but then if you used a gun to commit the aggravated battery, often it's a, it can be 10 years, sometimes 20 years additional time, and often mandatory time, so no possibility of early release. Oh, man. Um, and by the way, this is all of us, too. So all of us who conceal carry. And folks, for those of you not familiar with me, I conceal carry. I've concealed carry my whole adult life. I do it every day. Um, but if you defend yourself with that gun you're carrying, and it's your conduct's determined to be unlawful. Not only are you facing the penalty for whatever the underlying criminal charge might be, but because you used a gun 
in that course of action, you're also likely to face whatever the firearm sentencing enhancement is for your particular state. So all the more reason to make sure your conduct is well within the legal boundaries. Absolutely right. There you go. That's bottom line right there. Um, so, Andrew, uh, there's something else I wanted to talk to you about. This mug. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that mug. Um, and I'm. are those available now, by the way? They are available now. Let me make sure I know what the URL is. Let's see. I, I think it's just mug. Get yours today. <clears throat> the law of self defense.com. Yeah, law of um, self defense. A com slash mug. Uh, most of the comments that I'm seeing from this last video is the guy's just an idiot. It, what is he using the Black Rider black powder rifle because uh, apparently because of the smoke or whatever, which I thought was hilarious. But um, here's uh, probably an easy assumption. The guy that's serving the papers goes onto the lawn, gets shot at. If he's carrying a firearm, he can return fire. Absolutely 100%. Correct? Sure, he's under deadly force attack. Uh, now, whether that's the most prudent tactical thing to do, as opposed to you know getting to cover, uh, you know, being in a gunfight is the last thing you want to do. It's the thing you do when you have no better alternatives. If flight or cover or concealment is a better alternative, that's what I would urge him to do. If those are not possible, you can't just stand there and get yourself shot. You have to defend yourself if you have the means to do that. Now, another thing I would like to point out, I see a lot of comments saying, well, this was obviously not self-defense. And that's true. There's clearly no credible self-defense narrative here. Uh, but that's usually the case, folks. So the vast majority of claims of self-defense in the criminal justice system are nonsense claims of self-defense. As nonsensical as this claim, they're claims being made by bad actors who don't have other le any other legal defense to fall back on. So their attorney is basically in a position where he says, well, look, we can either plead guilty or we can try this. We can try this self-defense thing and see if we can make it stick. He doesn't think it's going to stick. The client doesn't think it's going to stick. Nobody in the courtroom thinks it's going to stick. And it doesn't stick. And the person gets convicted. The reason it's important to keep this in mind is not because we would be that bad actor. It's because when people like us, normal law-abiding people, are involved in the use of force event and then try to justify our use of force as lawful self-defense, that's the normal self-defense claim seen in the system are the bad claims. So the presumption is that every claim that comes across is the bad claim. Yours is not the first self-defense claim that's coming across that investigator's desk or that prosecutor's desk or that judge's courtroom that week. They've seen lots of self-defense claims and all the other ones were BS. What do you think they presume yours is too? Well, and that's exactly why you're hard to kill when you carry a gun. You know the law, so you're hard to convict. And that's why you're going to get your free copy of the book right now. LawofSelfDefense.com forward slash book. Just pay the shipping and handling. Uh, Andrew, as always, it's such a pleasure to have you here, man. We, uh, I get messages all the time. You can read them in comments if you have the time to go back through. But how many people appreciate you taking the time to be here? with us it's just awesome man i really appreciate you being here i know uh we're we're cutting these uh shows a little shorter these days we're gonna try to stick to around 30 minutes folks so we're a little over that right now but uh it sure is valuable and here's the thing that i want you to know we're gonna be doing this every week come back next week please for the same time uh and then also share this video please with your friends we want to inform everybody you know, it, it's you're just doing them a favor. Buy the book, give it as a gift, get one for free, and uh, read it. Just it's it's knowledge, right? And that's such a great thing to give to other people, and uh, hopefully it saves them from doing something they shouldn't be doing and uh, making good decisions. So, yes, thank you, Andrew, very much, and thank you for the mug, man. I appreciate that. Very very sure. nice. Mm -mm. My pleasure. A small Christmas gift to Nate and uh, Alien Gear Holsters. Although only Nate got the actual bug, the rest of you will just have to appreciate the sentiment. Um, <laughs> but folks, uh, as scary as all these videos often seem, I do want to encourage all of you. Uh, if you have kept your conduct within the legal boundaries, if you knew what the legal boundaries were in the first place, obviously, if you don't know what they are, you're relying on pure dumb luck to hope that you stayed within the legal boundaries. But if you know 
where the legal boundaries are. And folks, again, it's only those five elements. That's It's not rocket science. But if you know where those boundaries are and you stay within them, you are extremely hard to convict. A prosecutor has to disprove your claim of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a very high threshold. Unfortunately, too many people hand the prosecutor the evidence he needs to do that. But if you can keep yourself from making yourself vulnerable to that kind of prosecution, you're a hard target to convict. And hard targets to convict are not frequently brought to trial. That's where you want to be. But you can only be there if you have the knowledge necessary. Right. Uh, a whole other topic, maybe another show on this, but let's say you do stay within those boundaries. And I know that you and I have talked about this, but some people may be new to the show. Um, and I know you have a DVD on this specific topic, uh, but uh, you still have to, I mean, get an attorney. You still have to fight the legal fight. Maybe you don't go to trial, but you're still going to be spending some money, right? Well, how much money you're going to have to spend is something that's n not within your control uh, because other people are making decisions. So if the police who respond to the scene, the investigators that follow those first responders decide it looks like self-defense to them, they may not charge you at all, in which case it won't cost you much money. But if they decide to arrest you and kick it up to the prosecutor's office for them to make the decision, well, then you're at least going to have to make bail and bail's going to cost you money. If the prosecutor decides to charge you, uh, then you're at least going to go through the pretrial process, which is going to cost you, if you've used a gun, thirty to fifty thousand dollars pretrial expense. If they decide to take you to trial, you're looking at potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. And because you don't control those decisions, you have to be prepared for the worst possibility. And you know, when we think about the physical fight, we don't prepare to defend ourselves, to defend our families against the attacker that will stop if we politely ask him to stop, right? That's not what we're worried about. We're worried about the attacker who will not stop. Well, in terms of the legal fight, you have to be worried about a criminal justice system that will not stop, that does not uh, buy your narrative of self-defense, that convinces itself that you deserve to be prosecuted and then you're facing a lot of expense, a lot of time, and a lot of legal risk, and that's the risk you have to be prepared for. Not for what the criminal justice system might do if it's feeling favorably disposed, but for what it can do if it decides it wants to throw the book at you. There you go. A lot to talk about. Um, maybe next week we can get into to some more of these things. I know there's people talking about uh, church shootings and stuff like that, and. Well, you know, we, we can we can get into some of these other things at a different time. Today, though, it is time to wrap it up, unfortunately, because, um, you know, we could talk about this all day. I know you do. And uh, again, I want to thank you for your time, Andrew, and thank all of you for showing up. We appreciate being here. Uh, we get to sit here and talk about this stuff because of you. So and thanks, before, before we go, I've been trying to type the URL for the book and stuff into uh, YouTube, and it looks like YouTube might be blocking it because people keep asking me. So, folks, if you're interested in the infographic, it's just lawselfdefense.com slash elements. If you're interested in the free book, it's simply lawofselfdefense.com slash book. That's there it. you go. Sorry, sorry it's not showing up in uh, YouTube, but that's uh, obviously outside of my control. There you go. Uh, get that graphic five elements you're going to want that next week we're going to talk about those maybe we'll just break those down next week and uh be very clear about what those are so if, if uh, you get it and you're crazy if you don't get it uh please have it with you for every one of these shows because i don't have time to go through all five elements repeatedly yeah. uh, but if you have it with you then you can quickly reference whatever element we're talking about and it'll really facilitate your ability to understand what we're discussing awesome thank you andrew thank you riley for setting all this up i know it's not easy all the time and we are always got technical difficulties but thank all of you for showing up we appreciate it that's it for today. Tomorrow is the raffle. You can still get signed up right now at aliengearholsters.com forward slash contest, where if you are a lucky winner, you're going to get an autographed hardcover copy of this book tomorrow, but you got to get signed up there at the raffle to do so. So, and then we'll see you back here tomorrow, same time for that raffle. 
Uh, that's it for this week. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, all of you. From all of us at Alien Gear, please carry safe. Carry in comfort. Carry on. Cheers to a smooth new year. Alien Gear Holsters wants to help you kick off the new year snag-free with the new Sig Sauer P365 SAS. One lucky winner will win a Bigfoot gun belt, a Tactica tactical laptop bag, an Alien Gear shoulder holster, an Alien Gear IWB holster, and the Sig Sauer Anti-Snag P365. Win these prizes by entering now at aliengearholsters.com forward slash contest.